So my name is Kareem Yagmore. Some of you may have known me for um, the stuff I write. I wrote the Building Embedded Linux Systems book. I am currently writing an embedded Android book for O'Reilly, which is already available um, in, as a pre-release as we speak. Um, it's still an ongoing piece of work, so um, it's <coughs> I'm known in the uh, open source world for getting into trouble on mailing lists. Um, nothing really. See, but <laughs> Pursuing tracing in real time stuff <laughs> six or seven years ahead of the curve. Anyway, um, so I introduced the Linux Trace Toolkit um, at the end of the 90s. Um, actually, kind of like uh, maintained it up to, say, 2005. Headed that over to um, Matt Tu, who's actually doing a talk at the same time, unfortunately, but anyway. Um, and I guess you can grab the, the kernel sources for my name. Uh, I, I try to tend to help people with it code running in every Android device, or whatever that. Anyway, but that being said, I don't know everything, okay? I just know my way around, so um, you might actually give me a question which I can answer, and um, you know, I'll try to answer that afterwards, okay? So, um, before I actually get um, started, um, I just wanted to get, you know, feel here if there is any interest um, in a uh, mini uh, embedded Android workshop, and let me actually fill you in here. Um, so there was a embedded Android workshop yesterday, uh, which was a full day workshop, um, which was partially kind of mainly because the advertisement of the class went out at the same time that the Linux Foundation site went down. So, um, we had a lot of people sign up. Um, so the idea that was floated was that uh, we could do not necessarily a repeat of that workshop, which was a full day, about six hours worth of class, uh, but we would do something like a two-hour miniature thing on Friday morning. Um, is Are there people here that might be interested in that? And which topics uh, will be covered? Sorry? Which topics will be covered? Which topics will be covered? Um, good question. So essentially, how do you take Android and put it in better device? Yeah? Could you just keep your hands up so I can put a count and report back to the Linux Foundation folks? So we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Okay, but um, about 15, 16 people. All right. So um, uh, they will let you know essentially by email whether or not that actually happens. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about today essentially is how do you leverage in any way, shape, or form the fact that Android is based on Linux um, when you are actually creating an Android device. Uh, not so much as an application developer, um, because you know, that's kind of off topic for, for me. Um, you can go and check the documentation on the web. They have plenty of documentation on how to develop applications. What they don't have documentation about is how to take Android and put it on your um, touch-based device. All right? Um, talk about why we want to actually do that and you know, proceed on to actual demos. That's really where I'd like to spend uh, some of the time here actually showing you stuff. Um, you, know, um, you know, merging Android with existing or legacy, so to speak, um, Linux stuff that you might have or that you might uh, want to compile or get from um, Get on your actual Android device, right? Um, I'm pretty easy going about these presentations, so you do feel free to cut me off and ask any questions. I, in fact, tend to get boring when I don't get any questions. So, um, there is incentive for you to ask questions. So, yeah, um, my goal is to open as many cans and worms as possible. Um, that's the goal here. You know, Android is a totally separate, new user space um, from the traditional uh, Linux stuff. Um, and the moment you try to kind of like commingle it with Linux stuff, things start to get kind of messy, right? So there are things which are uh, totally unscripted, and in fact, I'll uh, give you a list of stuff that I don't know that anybody's solving them right now, or if they are, they're not talking about it. So it'd be interesting to see how these things are uh, are being done or can be done. Um, why do you want to leverage anything from Linux? Right? Uh, well, Linux has been around, all right, fairly longer at least than Android. So there's a tremendous amount of work that's been put in getting various packages to work fine 
with Linux. The question then becomes is, can that stuff be reused, like I said, all right? The other thing that you might want to do is get some legacy stacks or legacy code that you've developed under Linux to work in a friendly fashion with Android. Um, so that's another good reason uh, to do that. Uh, another thing is, you know, if you've got, um, you know, any sort of, um, sorry, <coughs> complex package that has its own build system, um, it likely will require rewriting the entire build system for Android uh, because it has its own build system that is non-recursive that I can talk to you about that with Nosium. But essentially, uh, they're not using the regular, you know, make file, you know, summons other make files, summons other make files. Okay, that's not really the way they're structuring this thing. Um, so that's a little bit of the, of the rationale, all right? Um, of course, there's the, you know, for me, um, one of the incentives uh, that I find strongest is the fact that Android has a very, uh, you know, my way or the highway philosophy. Right, they, they got their own little things and they're really doing it in their, in their own little pond and you, you know you come in with your own stuff, it doesn't play nice by default with whatever you're bringing on. Okay, so you kind of have to twist its arm to make it um, do interesting things. All right, but before I get going here, and let me make sure I have a good feel here of um, folks sitting down here. So who's any sort of Linux kernel developer? <coughs> okay, got a few. Any sort of Android application developers right here? Yeah, rare breed. Okay, good. <laughs> right crowd. Uh, anybody who's done any sort of Android platform stuff? Yeah? Okay. So before I get going, I need to introduce a few concepts or terminologies that are, you know, intrinsic to Android. All right, or at least understand the mindset that Android comes with, or that you have to have when you're working with Android, if nothing else, just to have kind of like a common nomenclature with the guys doing the application development for your platform, okay? And this becomes really crucial when you're trying to mix and match uh, Android's functionality with Linux, because the development paradigms, application paradigms are completely different from one another, right? So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I really want to make sure we're on you know, solid ground here. First of all, apps in Android are developed as components. So in other words, you describe your application as a separate set, um, so sorry, um, as a number of separate components. So you have four different components, activities, which are essentially UI elements. You have services, which you can think of as daemons. Um, you have broadcast receivers, which are uh, kind of like a broadcast system, like an interrupt handler would be at a kernel level, but you know, in user space. Like for example, you get um, notif notified when the battery is low, when the phone signal changes, and that kind of stuff. Right? And finally, you got content providers, which are essentially databases. And in fact, the way you talk to them, uh, it looks like a REST API. So these are the four components that you can mix and match in your application. You cannot add new components, so these are the four base ones. Um, and you can have as many of those as possible. Now, your app doesn't have a single entry point. It has n entry points, one per component. Depending on what happens in the system, the components will get triggered, they will get you know, launched, they will, you know, whatever. You know, something's going to happen with those things. And the way you describe those components in this, to the system is uh, through a manifest file, which I'm going to talk about in a second. All right? Now, um, the components of your app are all housed within a single Linux process. Okay? So unless you do anything special, uh, your 10 activities and 30 services, they're all running in a single Linux process. Okay? Now, these components are interesting in and of themselves, but you know how do they interact? How do they get invoked? Uh, that's where this mechanism comes in place. This thing called intents. Uh, intents on a programming level are just uh, stupid, passive 
data uh, object. Um, it's what you put in them and how you dispatch that object that makes a difference. So you can say, uh, for example, if I am, if I wrote an email application, I might have my main activity being a list of emails, right? And then when I click on one of these emails, it might shoot off an intent saying, open this email. And of course, the activity that corresponds to this intent may be within the same app that I wrote. So therefore, it starts this new activity, but then maybe there's a PDF attached, and the, the user clicks on the PDF to open that up. Well, how does the application know how to open the PDF? Well, it doesn't, right? It shoots off an intent, and the system says, the guy wants to read a PDF. Anybody out there? Uh, and of course, if there's an app that said that it can deal with those PDFs, it will get that, int that intent and start off the, um, the reader so that the user can see his PDF. Okay, so that's, um, you know, in software development terms, you can call it a late binding mechanism. Um, I generally think of it as a, um, a polymorphic unix signal without a designated recipient, but that's usually my unix bias coming. <laughs> so um, that's for the intents, okay? So you can see already that this is fairly different from what you would have if nothing else on Linux desktop, which doesn't use this kind of mechanism. It's really specific to Android. Now the other thing is that the system um, is designed from the user experience point of view so that the user never actually has to understand that he's got apps open, all right? He's just clicking on stuff around, going back home, relaunching stuff. This notion of task switching doesn't exist, right? Um, and essentially what's happening underneath is the system is letting you to run as many applications as you want, creating as many processes as you want, but when, it, when you know, push comes to shove and there's no more memory, somebody's going to have to go. All right? So then it decides at random, so to speak, it's not really random, but you know, it assume it's random, that some process housing a few um, components is going to have to go. And at that point, you know, the components that are housed in that process are all going to die. But the user experience of the user should be that whenever he comes back to this task, that it should all appear to him as if nothing can happen. So that's why you have to manage life cycle if you're at developing applications. Um, and this is an example of the life cycle. I'm not going to go too deep into that. But this is one of the pieces of puzzles that um, app developers have to deal with if they're developing uh, Android applications. Again, this is completely contrary to what you would have in this world where you start an application or the user starts an application. It is not expected that this thing is going to go away unless A, it crashes or B, the guy closes it, okay? It's going to be there forever. <clears throat> so the thing that brings all of these pieces together with regards to Android is the thing called the manifest file. If you're looking for a single entry point to your app, that's likely the most you know, the closest thing that you will find. So in there, uh, in an XML format, you describe the various components that you have, and you have to declare most of them statically. In other words, head to build. Um, and there's at least one, I mean, the broadcast receiver is the only exception to that where you can actually create uh, those at, at runtime uh, as much as you need. So that's for the, uh, the, manifest, the manifest file. So just to speak of processes and threads uh, just a second here. So like I said, all components will be housed um, in a single Linux process unless you actually fork um, a thread off and using you know, regular Java programming. Uh, and in some cases, some components will have some of their methods being run on thread pool. So for example, if you publish, if you have a service that publishes an API, and somebody invokes that API, the invocation, the call E, will be run on a thread pool. Um, same thing with content providers. But apart from those, you're mostly run, running in a single uh, Linux process. <clears throat> the last thing I want to talk about before I actually start talking about stack comparisons here is how um, inter-process communication goes on. Um, traditionally in Linux you have um, sockets uh, or pipes or you know, some of the more familiar mechanisms. In Android they use this mechanism called binder. Okay? If you're looking for information on binder, binder actually uh, was started uh, as part of BOS and that was later uh, whatever you know, work was done on, uh, in there and BOS was acquired by Palm. 
um, and eventually Paul before uh, you know knifing the project some of the engineers um, were able to get it open sourced and they put this out uh, as something called open binder so if you want to understand the paradigms behind binder you want to look on the internet for open binder they have a lot of documentation about the, the uh, uh, engineering design decisions that went into you know uh, how the thing works and so on and so forth but <coughs> open binder has um, the code base for open binder has nothing to do with the binder code that's in Android. Okay, they just share the same um, logical design in between them. And essentially, what binder does is allow the Android development team to create an object-oriented operating system on top of a general-purpose op uh, operating system. And it will make more sense uh, as I move uh, forward. A little bit here. But that's for you know how things work. So essentially, you grab through the binder reference to an object, um, which essentially is a service, and then you evoke methods of that service. So that's how the notifications are done, and that's how uh, the window manager works, and you know a lot of the system services are wrapped around that. Okay? Any questions up to here? All right. Good. We're all going to pass the test at the end. <laughs> This is a very basic architecture for an embedded Linux system. You got a kernel at the bottom, um, C library somewhere on top of it, um, probably BusyBox or most likely BusyBox, and then whatever stack that you have up there that you've developed or that you've taken from somebody else. Okay, um, this should be you know fairly uh, common knowledge. This is Android. Anything north of the Linux kernel does not exist. Right, they, 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 if if you were um, if you were a proponent of the uh, GNU slash Linux moniker, they took the GNU um, out the back door, shot him in the head, and ran away with the penguin. Okay, uh, that's what's happening over here. So um, the uh, <laughs> sorry for the uh, Tarantino kind of scenario here. So the Linux kernel, of course, is the same Linux kernel that we all know, except they changed a bunch of things inside of it. Okay? But the changes they made make no difference, or almost no difference, okay, for legacy stuff that you might want to run with Android, or on Android, or side by side with it, whatever it is that you want to you know, conceive of it being. Uh, the most important thing that they did is they added this mechanism called the wait box. So by default, the um, Linux kernel will only suspend if you ask it to suspend if I close the lid of my laptop and the driver doesn't crash and my laptop will come back. Um, to get extra. So, um, in, in, in Android, they kind of like changed it. Uh, they made it so that the kernel sleeps as soon as possible and as often as possible. But to keep it awake, you've got to grab the wake clock. Um, so that's been the biggest bone of contention for the inclusion of Android functionality inside Linux. Now, on top of um, uh, the Linux kernel, they built a whole new, like I said, stack of stuff. So, in terms of libraries, they have a C library, it's called Bionic. Um, it is non POSIX compliant. Okay? Um, so, I was doing a presentation a couple of weeks back uh, at the Embedded Systems Conference in Boston. We were using Beagle boards, and one of the exercises was to actually have the Beagle board talk to um, this TI Kronos watch through an RF gizmo and USB, which actually appears like a serial console. Um, and I had written um, a small under, underliner essentially on my workstation that worked fine to talk to the watch for this USB um, uh, port. Uh, except the same underliner, when I tried to compile it with Bionic, it started failing in a number of places because um, functions were slightly different, um, you know, um, uh, constants were slightly different, and so on and so forth. So it is a C library, but it really is Android's you know, kind of way of doing it. There's some stuff that we, you already know, like uh, WebKit's in there, OpenSSL is in there, and a number of you know, standard stuff that you'll find um, in, in most Linux distributions. They also have uh, their own kind of init, okay? Um, if you're familiar with System 5 init or, um, what is it again? Upstart. System Upstart, D. Somebody said. System D. System D, whatever it is. Anyway, uh, that's different. Yeah, they wrote their own little thing. The interesting thing about this init is that it maintains a global a pool of variables uh, which are accessible from anywhere in the system and that can trigger, um, sorry, 
the changes to those variables can trigger the execution of code. So in other words, you provide an RC configuration file that says, if variable foo changes from 0 to 1, do this. All right? And then some bit of code somewhere in the, in the system says, flip it to 1. And then that bit of code runs. Um, so it's kind of like an interesting way of um, causing things to happen. So for example, very rapidly here, if you're used to do USB debugging with your phone, when you're doing application development, of course nobody raised his hand here, uh, application development, an application developer can use a phone to do app development, um, and you have to go into settings and say, enable USB debugging, that's what's actually doing, flipping a bit, uh, which essentially causes the DADB daemon to launch, and then you can actually connect your phone to talk. All right? Toolbox. Um, Busybox, anybody know this? Oh, All right, cool. So let's just illustrate things here. So let's say the full application as known Linux sits somewhere over here. There's a functionality. All right. So that's the most features you will find. Um, BusyBox sits around here. All right. In terms of comparison, um, Toolbox is somewhere behind this wall. Okay. It is very limited in terms of functionality. Um, and the first thing I personally do when I start using, uh, start doing any sort of platform development in Android is I nuke, um, not, well, I don't nuke in Toolbox, but I just put BusyBox right there to actually start doing any serious stuff, okay? There's a bunch of native daemons, um, and there is the hardware, some, some hardware support stuff that's done in user space, and that's really peculiar to Android. They've uh, made it so that the um, OEMs can actually put a lot of the brains that control their hardware into user space so they can keep a proprietary. Okay, I'll we'll talk to you about that at Nozium, but that's not the point of this presentation. Up on top of this stuff, you have the Dalvik virtual machine, um, and one of the most important pieces running on top of this is this system server here. Okay? Um, in fact, if you look at the diagram that they have online uh, that Google provides for the architecture of Android, that part's not there. Uh, there's some spots open here, guys, by, by the way, if you are, if you dare walk. <laughs> um, so, um, the system server is something I actually discovered by looking at the code. Um, and essentially, it is the brain of Android. And remember I said that the binder mechanism allows them to create an object-oriented operating system on top of the general purpose operating system. This is the object-oriented operating system, the system server. So the window manager is in there, package manager, the activity manager, remember I said there's a life cycle for applications, uh, that's what's taking care of that. Um, so anything that's really important going on is happening in there. Um, the develop, app developer documentation doesn't refer to the system server in any way, shape, or form. What it will say is the system does X or Android does X. But what, what really is it, it's saying is that the system server is doing that. So you don't usually talk to the system server directly. What you do um, as an app developer, you, um, an app developer would talk to the Android packages, which they would talk through the binder to the system services. Right? So that's generally how Android is architecture. Any questions on that? I'm starting to get worried here. <laughs> OK, so um, what if I want to mix legacy or classic Linux stuff with Android? What problems am I going to hit? All right, the first one is the file system. Yes, sir? Is all that stuff open source? What is? <laughs> above the kernel. Yes, it is. Oh, so the question is, is the stuff above the kernel open source? Um, the AOSP, which um, is the Android Open Source Project, which houses all of that, essentially north of the kernel, um, is <coughs> open source, or at least was open source up to version 2.3 of Android. Um, they are supposed to put 4.0 uh, in open source in the coming weeks. Um, they at least confirmed that it would be open source, whereas 3.0 was not uh, open source. Make sense? All right. Cool. Sorry? Yes, correct. Um, I don't have the time to delve into the licensing issues today, but if we do a mini workshop on Friday, I will talk about the licensing. So yes, the the um, everything off the kernel is Apache license, not GPL license, and that was by design. So the reason they wrote toolbox and didn't use busyboxes, toolboxes. BSD, not uh, GPL as busy boxes, and you know, a variety of different pieces of like that. Um, so I was talking about Android going the, you know, my way or the highway philosophy. So Android does not conform to the file system hierarchy standard, which is the basically the document that is used by most distributions to kind of like lay out the file system. 
they have their own layout. So they reuse some of the uh, conventional stuff that you have in Linux, uh, but they don't use it as is. So for example, there is no slash bin or slash lib, which is great, because that, that means we can use it for whatever we want to put there, all right? Uh, but some other stuff is a little bit more funky. So for example, slash SC is a symbolic thing to system SC. So if you screw around with that, you have to make sure that it's still consistent with regards to Android. Um, the other thing is, and the most, the biggest problem really is the C library. So if you've got stuff, um, and generally, you know, that's that's what I see in the field with the folks I talk with and work with, um, is that they already developed, you know, through the years, a stack of stuff that compiles just well on GLC, right? And they're not about to port that to Bion, <coughs> the reasons I mentioned earlier, okay? Um, sometimes I get the uh, question is, okay, well, can I just take Bion and cap and put GLC? Um, sure, Chinese torture is in the same category. Um, so, you know, you don't want to go there. <laughs> just let Android use Bion, okay? And the question will be, how do we get GLC to coexist? And we'll actually see that um, in the demo. <coughs> the other thing is the interconnect fabric is completely different. Usually in Linux it's Dbus, in Android it's Intense. Um, so, you know, depending on how you want to mix and match your applications, you're going to have to find some way to get those two things to coexist if you're using Dbus. Um, the other thing is the IPC mechanisms are slightly different. Like I said, you know, Android relies on Binder. Uh, usually, if you're doing any sort of IPC in Linux, you're using System 5 IPC or you know, sockets or whatever it is uh, that you are using. Okay, display management. Um, they killed X. <laughs> so they're not using X in any way, shape, or form. They have this thing called the Surface Planer, uh, on which their window manager sits on, right on top. Uh, I can't really say I'm crying for X, but you know, busy box I am. Uh, so, uh, but if you wrote applications that use X, you have an issue there. Okay, how do you kind of get those things to work together? Will have to be something that you determine. And finally, of course, uh, you can't have X sitting side by side with Android on the same framework. Okay? Um, somebody's going to have to control something. Um, yes, sir? How is the um, hardware acceleration um, controlled? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear the, the question. The hardware acceleration of uh, the control. Hardware acceleration? Yeah, like uh, uh, OpenGL or stuff like that. How can this be funneled into this server? In this so the hardware acceleration will be taken care of by the HAL layer of Android. So usually the SOC manufacturer or GPU manufacturer will provide the necessary HAL components to do the hardware acceleration for Android. And are these compatible with the kernel mode for switching stuff? Are they compatible with the kernel mode <coughs> switching stuff? Um, that's a very good question. I can tell you that a lot of a lot of these uh, GPU manufacturers are struggling with with Android uh, because it's it's a completely new development paradigm for their hardware support uh, that doesn't resemble X, doesn't resemble anything they've done. Um, so I I can't speak of the problems they may or may not encounter. Um, uh, I can say that a year ago it was really free for all, no standards at all. I'm sorry. A year ago, it was sort of free for all, no standards at all. Free for all is the only word I heard. Uh, okay. A year ago, there wasn't any standards, so okay, there so is, yeah. everything was in, incompatible. I don't know how it is nowadays, but yeah. So usually, what will happen is the the um, the hardware manufacturers will work with the uh, OEM to kind of get the hardware to work. Okay, whatever clutch they have to use, they'll they'll make sure it works. Um. <coughs> right. So the question is, where do I start? You know where, you know where do I get going here to get my stuff to make some match with Android? Well, of course, on the Android side, you're going to have to go with with the OSP. Um, that's the starting point for anybody doing any sort of um, platform work uh, in Android. Uh, in Linux, you of course have a number of options. All right, um, you can use some of the um, traditional distributions that are out there, but that's going to probably be heavy-handed with regards to um, you know what you what you what you do with it. Um, you can use uh, some of the embedded distros. Uh, if there's any Yocto people here, they're going to hate me for putting Yocto as an embedded distro. But anyway, um, it's something that generates your root file system. Okay, whatever it is that you want to uh, categorize it as. Uh, you can also build your own 
Uh, actually, that's what I did for the uh, hands-on here, which I'm going to show you. And you can, of course, cherry pick the building, you know, packages A, B, C, and E as you want. The question then becomes is how do I get the stuff to coexist? All right. What are the various kind of like approaches of doing that? Um, so the first approach you can take is integrate into Android's build system. Sometimes that works because your package, package is small enough, but sometimes that can be overly complicated because you have an entire build system and it's you know recursive based, uh, uh, sorry, recursively based on traditional make files, and that will just not work with Android. Um, the other thing you can do is build what I call build time aggregation. So essentially, as the Android build system is generating its stuff and write, writing it to um, uh, images, you just tag along and get it to copy your own stuff. I find this to be kind of like very elegant in terms of what it do gives you in practice. Um, some people, what they resort to is image repackaging, sometimes because they don't have any other choice. Is you grab an image, you extract it, you put stuff inside of it, repackage it, put it back on the device and get that to do whatever you want. And that's another way to do it. Another way to do it is to actually use troop jails. So if, um, some people here uh, might have attended Grigoire Chanty presentation at the uh, ELC in San Francisco about six months ago. Um, Grigoire was demonstrating basically having, um, I think it was a panda board or beagle board, I can't remember which one it was, but anyway, the, he had like five or four monitors connected to this thing. And that single board um, had four separate distributions, one on each screen. Okay, so it had Android, Chrome OS, Ubuntu, and Angstrom, I think, or something like that. Um, and you could do that because every one of those had its own separate frame buffer. And then you can you can actually watch um, his presentation, which I think the Free Electrons guys take, uh, as he describes how complicated and hairy it was to actually have all of those things to sit side by side in a friendly fashion. Okay, uh, but it is an approach that you can probably use. Okay. Um, the one approach I haven't seen used yet is virtualization, kind of like um, putting it in a box in Zen or, or VMware or whatever it is. Uh, though I know VMware's um, been working on actually virtualizing phones, and I think they even have a demo from the pod or some Samsung or something like that. So these are the general approaches that you could use to get the stuff to coexist. Does that make sense? <coughs> yeah. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Maybe in a Chakarut uh, way, I have a uh, band of the Linux system that uh, needed to interface using TCP socket yep. inside the system, the target, and uh, files and uh, serial port. Is it possible or not? Is it possible to have them uh, socket, talk to each other through sockets? Sockets should be a problem. Files might be a problem because you're in a shoot jail. Socket is, is a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. Shouldn't be. Sorry. Shouldn't be a problem. Sorry. It's a socket. So, so uh, Android inside, uh, in look, uh, it's possible to, to read and write uh, using TCP standard socket. Yes, um, I'll actually show you a demo of that. Okay. All right. Um, just a few examples of what's been done. I really just uh, it took me two minutes to write the slide. This will probably a lot more than it. Um, one of the interesting um, actually hacks that I've seen is GStreamer. So some folks just replaced. Stage Fright, which is the media layer uh, in Android, by GStreamer, which is the standard media layer uh, in Linux. Uh, there was actually a presentation about that, I think, yesterday at the GStreamer conference, unfortunately, I could not attend that. Um, the folks of, at CyanogenMod actually put BusyBox into the build system of Android, uh, but they had to actually <coughs> modify BusyBox because Bionic lacks certain functionalities that are used by BusyBox, and therefore they had to expose some system calls which aren't exposed by, by uh, by Bionic. Um, there's also an interesting um, product that there, that you know, at least actually a number of products that get Android apps to actually run on standard Linux. I'm looking forward to an open source implementation of that. Uh, most, I mean, the, the all the products I've seen that do that today are actually doing some proprietary something, um, and I don't really understand what the I, I kind of have a general idea of what they're doing, but I don't have precise details of what's going on. Uh, stuff that I haven't seen been done, uh, using Binder over glibc. Um, so Binder is Bionic based. Uh, so Binder, the, the Binder is not that complicated, so writing um, um, or 
essentially porting the lib binder over to glibc might not be that complicated, but I didn't see that being done. Um, some kind of intent to debus bridge that I have not seen uh, being done. Kind of like send an intent and transfer that over to debus or send send something off of debus and get it added. <coughs> didn't see the, haven't seen that. And uh, mixing and matching X applications on Android. Um, so my interesting my interest was to get Android apps running in X. And I can remember what story was covered in Linux Weekly News in which I posted a comment saying essentially that. And to which Brian Swetland, who's the one of the kernel maintainers uh, in the Android development group at Google, actually responded with the snippet which is underneath. He said, you know, actually it might be in more or easier to just get X applications to run uh, on Android. All right. Um, so I found his his, uh, his suggestion interesting, but I haven't seen anybody doing that either. Okay. Which gets me to the demos. So what I have is three demos, um, and I think I just have just enough time to actually do that. <coughs> So in all three demos, what I'm going to show you is going to be based on the AOSP and a mix of a glibc-based um, uh, file system. All right. So what I have is Android generating its own file system. I'm generating another file system on the side here, and I'm getting Android to copy my file system into it. All right. And the second demonstration, the second demo is to actually have a client-server architecture where I have the client or a uh, client or server, like uh, one running on Bionic and the other running on glibc, and then actually talking to the socket. So if you have your own stack built on glibc, you can have kind of like a monitor that sits in there and talks to a socket to another monitor that's in the Bionic world, and then they can exchange stuff back and forth. All right. And the final demo will be a slice of this. All right. Uh, <coughs> so let me. Set myself up here. Okay. So just to show you what I have, here I have uh, an Android, uh, an AOSP. Basically, this is a uh, sources of Android, which will actually run in an emulator in, in QEMU. Okay. What I also have um, is bigger. is a file system, a root file system, which I generated essentially using the methods I was describing in my um, first book um, on how I actually, you know, hand build a root file system uh, for an embedded Linux system, all right? So essentially what's in here is um, BusyBox, it has um, GLC, and the thing I'm going to do is actually get the AOSP to copy the content of that root file system into the final file system it generates, okay? So just follow me here as I'm hacking my way around. Apologies to those that love VI, I'm an Emacs person. Hard feelings. Um, so the first thing I need to do is change the make file that generates the final file system of Android to actually copy my little thing here. So let me go here and um, go to core, root dear, Android MK. So this is the uh, make file that uh, generates the, final, uh, the file system. I'm going to essentially cheat here because I've already done this hack. So I'm just going to go and copy paste what I've already got done somewhere else. AOSP 237 system core root dear. OK, copy this guy here. Into here. OK. So now I have myself um, essentially uh, I, when I build this thing, all the stuff that's in my other file system will get copied here. However, there are a few things that have to be uh, we have to be careful about. First of all, the way Android generates its file system, it applies some rule rights which are defined in the header. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. It's got this include file. Which essentially says the contents of 
S bin have got to have these rights, the content of bin have got to have these rights, and so on and so forth. If I don't add a rule here for slash lib, then the content of slash lib will be non-executable, and all my glibc linked content will just not run. Okay? So I just need to hack this guy here. Add lib. The other thing I want to do is actually make sure that when I shell into the emulator, I actually have a busy box, not tool box. So let me show you what I'm talking about here. So if I do emulator here, and I'll let this guy start, and I'm going to modify uh, my code while this actually finishes booting up. I will go to ADB. Um, services, look for bin sh. So essentially when you shell into an Android device, it runs system bin sh. System bin sh is essentially um, their own shell, which is like their toolbox thing, it's very limited and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to change this to busybox, which is in bin sh. Alright, we can actually probably shell into this bin. ADB shell. Oh, come on, it is not enough for There we go. So, um, this is LS. You don't have to have completion. Um, there's no color coding. There's, you know, it's really limited in terms of a shell. So, um, I was at, I changed ADB. The last, next thing I need to do is change the path um, so that when I, whenever I type LS or CP or whatever, it's running busy boxes, LS and CP, not toolbox. So this is in the initrc file, and I'm going to add bin over here. All right, <coughs> and then I'm going to let this guy run. <coughs> so um, this should take about two minutes to finish up. Once it's done, I'll be able to shell back into my emulator, and I will actually be running a uh, dynamically linked busybox with all the fancy stuff that BusyBox gives me. Okay? Questions up to here? Yes, sir? Does that break anything using BusyBox instead of the Android shell? Very, very good question. Does using the BusyBox shell break anything instead of using the um, Android shell? Um, that's not been my experience. I have not had any issues with uh, running... Not, not so far. Not so far. <laughs> Well, I'm not the only, I can tell you that I'm not the only person doing that. Um, so, you know, word on the street is <laughs> using BusyBox will not ruin your day um, with regards to Android. The thing is, it's assuming its stuff is in bin, its, its system bin anyway. So all of its stuff will not magically discover that there's a bin with stuff inside of it and start running that. Uh, it really is using uh, system bin. Can you just modify the path to include slash bin with BusyBox? Correct, I just changed the path. So does that influence anything? Well, the path is really mainly used when you actually shell into the device. So not, not actually when it is running its own stuff, if that makes any sense. Yes, sir? And placing the libc in lib is enough to load a busy box linked against glibc? Or is any um, other action needed for that? Is there any action to link uh, BusyBox again? Yeah, usually if you execute a binary, Bionic will be used. If you install a glibc in slash lib, this is enough to make BusyBox work then. Yeah, okay, is, is installing glibc enough to get G, uh, BusyBox to work? Yes, it is. Um, it, again, that's one of the other things is that uh, it, the AOSP looks for its libraries in system lib. So it's like a don't care situation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're coexisting on the same file system and there's no conflict in between both of them. Yes, sir? Would it be possible to replace... Uh, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Would it be possible to replace Bionic with GLibc? Um, is it possible to replace Bionic with GLibc? Um, jumping off a cliff without a rope is probably as, as, <laughs> as practical. Uh, it probably is. In fact, no, not it probably is. People have done that. <laughs> Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, ill has come to them, <laughs> so uh, don't try to do that. Um, Alright, so while this is compiling, let me actually start with the rest because uh, we're, we're going to be running out of time here. Um, so the other thing I want to show you here is actually uh, building a um, 
client on GLibc and a server on Bionic. So what I'm going to do here um, is I am going to go into the sources of the AOSP, go into external, create myself a server directory here, and I'm going to copy over a um, android.mk, which I know works and is simple enough for me to modify for any space. Um, CMD service android.mk here and copy off of my desktop server.c, put it in here. Um, go to external server. Modify this guy so we have we are going to build server.c. We don't need this, we don't need this. The local server. Hello. And I need to change one other thing here. Build. Sorry folks for lack of explanation here, but we're just gonna run out of time, so I want to make sure we actually have this going. Server. So essentially what I made sure here is that um, this new package which I added to the system um, gets built as part of the OSP. So we'll have a server binary on the actual file, final file system when we generate it. Um, so this guy should have finished building. It has. Emulator. Um, since I've done that, let me actually restart the build. Since I'm actually, I just added a new thing. All oh, right, I can probably just <coughs> this guy. Um, build EMB setup on stage. Let me just run uh, EMB shell. Lo and behold, we have color coding. Um, we have. Dab completion. Woo we even have this guy, which allows me to do something like. Oh yeah, for those of you who haven't noticed, I launched HTTPD. All right. You can also launch SendMail if you really want to. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure why you want to do that. But... Oh yes, I forgot something. Uh... Give the email for not being as fast as a child, but anyway, HTTP, local host. And we got a 404 not found, which means the HTTP naming did respond. Okay? Um, Alright, so here I have, essentially, now I have, I have one minute, eh? I can't overrun, can I? Not by much. Not by much. I will, I will do my best. Alright. Okay, so uh, I will launch the emulator again, which now has my um, server inside of it. Let me go compile the clients. Um, uh, race against time here. Uh, CD. Oh, this is uh, do I have it actually compiled already? Maybe I do. Uh, root FS. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, let me actually build it. Bingo, we have it. ADB push. Is it? It is. ADB push client. 
to them. thing I want to show you, um, which I will demo to you if you actually bug me about it, um, is actually running LTT and tracing Android with LTT and G. Um, that's pretty cool, uh, because um, Android gives you Logcat, uh, but if, and if you want to use tracing with, um, uh, with the kernel, then you have no correlation between those two things. And I've patched the OSP so that it dumps the stuff that goes into Logcat into LTT and G, so you actually have the mix of both things from the kernel and AOSP all talking in the same buffer. Alright? Thank you.